Hello guys, so today we shall be discussing another most important topic from the congenital heart diseases that is ventricular septal defect. So if you see ventricular septal defect, first of all how ventricular septal defect is formed, right? What will happen whenever there is ventricular septal defect, right? What are the hemodynamic changes and all? So everything we shall be discussing right now. So regarding this ventricular septal defect, one first important point you need to know is that this is the most common congenital heart defect which you're gonna see, right? So ventricular, sep ventricular septal defect, this is the most common congenital heart defect. Most common congenital heart defect. Point number two is that if there is mild ventricular septal defect, most of the ventricular septal defects which are mild are asymptomatic, right? What are symptomatic then? Symptomatic are those ventricular septal defects which are severe, right? When the gap is more, it is so severe, right? But first of all, we shall be discussing what is ventricular septal defect. All of you know very well that this is your right atrium, this is your left atrium. Between the two atria, you have got a septum, you call this as interatrial septum. The same way, this is your right ventricle, this is your left ventricle. In between both of these ventricles, you have got a septum like this. This is called as interventricular septum. Okay? How is this interventricular septum formed? Interventricular septum is formed by two things. What is the first thing? This red color bulb which you can see, right? This bulb which you can see, this is called as endocardial cushion, right? Now from this endocardial cushion, what happens is a small septum that comes all the way downward like this, okay? So from this endocardial cushion, a small septum comes all the way down like this. Next important thing is from the bottom, this septum which is going up, right? This is called as a muscular septum, okay? So there is a septum that is coming from the endocardial cushion and there is a muscular septum that is ascending up like this. So both the septums they join together and now they form a sept complete septum in between that is called as interventricular septum. Okay. Now this thing takes place embryologically. Another important thing which you need to know is that for example let us say this endocardial cushion started giving its own septum downwards like this. Now as it is giving its own septum downwards, as the septum is progressing downwards, suddenly the further progression stops. What do I mean by further progression stops is, let us say the septum ends up here itself. Okay, so the septum is coming down from the endocardial cushion, it is coming down, it is progressing down and suddenly due to some defect, might be due to some defect, the septum stopped here. But the muscular septa started developing till here. Muscular septa should develop till this point and the muscular septa properly developed till here. The problem is where? Problem is with the septa that is coming from the endocardial cushion. So as a result what is happening? Both of one is incomplete and the other one is complete. Right? So in both of them, either of the one is incomplete, you will find a opening there. This is so clear, right? So you found an opening there. Now this opening is present in the interventricular septa. You call this as a ventricular septal defect or simply called as interventricular septal defect. Okay? So this process basically takes place embryologically. So that is the reason why during the development of the fetus, during the development of the fetus, Two septas, one from bottom to top, another one from top to bottom, they both of them join together and should form interventricular septa. But during the fetal life, uh, due to some mutations, due to some defects, what will happen is there is incomplete formation and that is the reason why the baby or the neonate is having a defect in the ventricular septum and that is the reason why this condition is a congenital heart defect which comes by birth. Okay? So, what is this condition guys? What is this condition? Point number two is that endocardial tissue cushion, right? Endocardial cushion 
cushion tissue do not progress to give septa to give septa so when they do not progress to give septa obviously you will find an aperture or an opening that is called as ventricular septal defect right let us discuss about the pathogenesis okay now uh, pathogenesis in the sense the hemodynamic part okay if there is ventricular septal defect now what is going to happen what is going to happen is that point number one listen very carefully now don't write anything look here during ventricular systole right during systole basically uh, so especially ventricles during ventricular systole what is happening the ventricles are contracting okay the ventricles are contracting so your right ventricle is contracting Obviously, your left ventricle also will contract. So, when both the ventricles are contracting, normally what should happen guys, normally if there was a septum in between, these both act as a separate chambers, right? So, then what should happen? From the left ventricle, the oxygenated blood enters into the iota. From here, it supplies to different parts of your body. In the same way, from your right ventricle, the deoxygenated blood enters into this artery. This is called as a pulmonary artery, right? So, uh, strictly speaking, strictly speaking, this is called as a main pulmonary artery. Main pulmonary artery, okay? This, this guy over here, this guy over here, this is called as a main pulmonary artery. So, deoxygenated blood normally enters into the main pulmonary artery and from there it enters into the lungs for oxygenation. This is what happens basically. But right now as there is a defect in this neonate, what do you see? What do you see is that when the ventricle contracts, what will happen? Either blood from, right? So, here let us say you have got oxygenated blood. A lot of oxygenated blood is here. And, and on the other hand, you have got a lot of deoxygenated blood here in the right ventricle. Now, two things can happen. Either, either from the left ventricle, blood can jump into the right ventricle during the systole or blood from the right ventricle can jump into the left ventricle. But out of this, only one thing happens. What is that? Look here. Within the left ventricle, all of you know what are the pressures in the left ventricle, guys? Yeah, left ventricle muscle wall is comparatively thicker in comparison with the right ventricle because left ventricle has to pump the blood to distant organs, far away places. So it has to pump with a greater pressure. So the pressure which is maintained in the left ventricle is 120 by 80, right? 120 is your systolic and 80 being your diastolic. So let me take a rough value of the right ventricle. It is normally... 25 let us say 25 by 4 25 is the systolic 4 is the diastolic just a rough value okay so it will be between 20 to 30 actually the systolic value is so when ventricle is contracting that is called as systole so which value should i take into consideration i have to take 120 on the left side 25 on the right side now you tell me left side the pressures are more or on the right side the pressures are more Obviously, the left ventricle is having higher pressures. So, all of you know very important thing that fluids move from high pressure to low pressure. So, what do I mean by high pressure to low pressure is when the ventricle is contracting, 120 mm of mercury pressure is going up. As it is going up, on the other hand, 25 mm mercury is going up, right? So, when both the pressures are going up like this, as this is having higher pressure, as this is having lower pressure, blood from the high pressure system, blood from the high pressure system, what is it going to happen is, through this ventricular septal defect, this is going to shunt into the right ventricle, to the low pressure system. So now you tell me, shunting is from left to right, obviously don't confuse here, don't confuse, this is the left side, this is your right side. Now tell me, shunting is from left to right or right to left? Obviously, point 3 is that the shunt, the shunt which you see, this is from left side all the way to the right side. Left to right shunt. Cool. Okay. 
So in the first cardiac cycle, when the ventricle systole occurred, blood from the left side went to the right side. So what has happened? What has happened is, uh, let us say 30, 30 to 40%. Okay, let us have 50% of the blood added up here and the remaining 50% entered into your iota. In the second cycle, again when ventricle contracts, what is it going to happen? 50% blood goes into the iota and again the next 50, it adds up into the right ventricle. So, after every cycle, what is happening? After every cycle, what is happening is, already, already there is some amount of blood in the right ventricle. And that blood from where it is coming guys, already the blood which is in the right ventricle is coming from your head and neck and the lower limbs, right? So I, I hope this, I hope this all of you know that uh, you have got a vena cava on the top. This is called a superior vena cava and you have got a vena cava on the down. This is called inferior vena cava, right? So from the superior vena cava, deoxygenated blood from the head and neck drains into the right ventricle. From the lower part of your body, the blood drains into your right ventricle. So already there is a lot of blood in the right ventricle. Upon the systole, you are adding 50% extra amount of blood into the right ventricle. So when you are adding extra amount of blood into the right ventricle, whose responsibility is it to pump this blood into the pulmonary artery? Obviously, right ventricle is the one to take the complete responsibility to pump this blood up. Right? Now, as there is a lot of blood, and moreover, I told you the right ventricular wall is thinner in comparison with the left ventricle, right? Obviously, in this picture, you cannot see it, but uh, just imagine that the right ventricle wall is thin, the muscle is thin because it has to just pump with a pressure of 25 to eject the blood into the lungs, which are very near to the heart. You need not have high pressures. So what is happening here is extra amount of fluid, which is present in the right ventricle, right the right ventricle wall is not capable of sending or pumping all that fluid up into the pulmonary iota so what will happen see for example you are a man of a lean mass right you start going to the gym from today so what you do is that there are heavy weights over there you start lifting the weight but your muscle will not support to that but if you are constantly going to the gym and lifting the weight your muscle will adapt to that weight how it is going to adapt? Your muscle size increases. The same to same is happening here. When the right ventricular muscle, right, right ventricular wall is pumping against high amount of blood, pumping is against heavy weight, pumping against high resistance, what will happen is that the blood does not go up basically. So how the right ventricular wall adapts to that situation is that it will undergo hypertrophy. Simple thing, it will undergo hypertrophy. So right now your right ventricular wall is undergoing complete hypertrophy. So this is called as right ventricular hypertrophy. Right? So because of this left to right shunt, because of this left to right shunt, what is happening in the patient guys? What is happening is, there is right ventricular What is happening? There is right ventricular hypertrophy. There is right ventricular hypertrophy. Right? Now, not only right ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, fine. Patient is having right ventricular hypertrophy. Now, the muscle mass is so thick. Thick in the sense it is more thick than the left ventricular wall now. Okay? Now, when the muscle is so thick, can it pump with a greater force? Obviously, yes. The muscle is so thick, Cardiomyocytes are increased, the ATP production will be increased, the energy will be increased. So right ventricle can very easily pump this heavy amount of blood which is coming from the left ventricle here. It can pump it very easily so that all the blood enters into the pulmonary iota. Now the right ventricle is completely cleared because it has adapted to such an environment where the muscle mass is increased so it can very easily pump the blood and clear of clear of all the blood into the pulmonary iota so right now what is happening is all this blood is in the pulmonary iota now all this blood 
is in the pulmonary artery. Oxygenated and deoxygenated, everything is in the pulmonary artery. But what is the problem? The problem is you are sending excess amount of blood into the pulmonary aorta. Right? When you are sending excess amount of blood into the pulmonary aorta, don't you think the pulmonary aorta previously it used to receive a blood, right, of minimal amount. Now you are pumping extra amount of blood into the pulmonary aorta. So within the pulmonary aorta, as there is excess amount of blood, don't you think the pulmonary aorta will undergo dilation? Right? Because of heavy amount of blood, the pressures in the pulmonary aorta will be increased. As the pressures in the pulmonary aorta are increased, the pulmonary aorta undergoes dilation. Right? Normal pressure in the pulmonary aorta is around 14 millimeter of mercury. Right? In this case, as there is excess amount of blood going into the pulmonary aorta, the pulmonary aorta pressures are so high. You know how much high? They are more than 25 millimeter of mercury. If a pulmonary artery is having more than 25 millimeter of mercury pressure within that, you say that right now the pulmonary artery is undergoing hypertension. This is called as this condition is called as pulmonary artery hypertension. Right? So, what is happening in the patient? Right ventricular hypertrophy. Because of right ventricular hypertrophy, the muscle mass increased and it pumped all the blood into the pulmonary artery and pulmonary artery is normal pressure, right? Pulmonary artery normal pressure is around 14 millimeter of mercury but right now in the patient, the pulmonary artery pressure is too much. How much? It is more than 25 millimeter of mercury and this condition you called as pulmonary artery hypertension. So you have ended up getting pulmonary artery hypertension. So right now patient is having what? Patient is having pulmonary artery hypertension. Right? Pulmonary artery hypertension. So what will happen? Okay. You are telling me pulmonary artery pressures are more. Fine. So what is going to happen? What is going to happen is excess amount of fluid right now. Right? Excess amount of fluid here. So this excess amount of fluid, where is it guys? It is in your main pulmonary artery. Now this excess amount of fluid will be distributed to your left side. That is left pulmonary artery. That to also to your right pulmonary artery. So within these branches also, within these branches also, let me, let me uh, rub the picture and draw. This is the normal pulmonary artery, but right now in the patient, look at the pulmonary artery, how it is going to become. Yeah, how it is going to become is that the pulmonary artery will dilate like this. You see, the pulmonary artery undergoing dilation. Right? Why? Because it is completely stuffed with the blood under high pressure. So a lot of lot of fluid that has been accumulated within the pulmonary artery right now. So what is happening as a result of this? What is happening is pulmonary artery will stretch maximum and after some time what will happen is that pulmonary artery will as it is stretching normally the vessel is like this. Right, the vessel is like this. So it is stretching, stretching, stretching and finally when it stretches out, you see gaps in between. Right, so between the endothelial cells of the pulmonary artery, you see gaps. Through these gaps, the fluid escapes into the interstitium of your lung. The fluid escapes into the interstitium of the lung. So within the lung parenchyma, there is a lot of fluid right now. There is a lot of fluid. So this condition you call it as pulmonary edema. So pulmonary artery hypertension led to a very serious condition that is called as pulmonary pulmonary edema, right? So let us recap guys what has happened. Patient was having left to right shunt. Left to right shunt has caused excess amount of blood in the right ventricle leading to right ventricular hypertrophy. And after that, he is having pulmonary artery hypertension because of high pressures that is more than 25 millimeter of mercury. And finally, pulmonary artery hypertension led to pulmonary edema. Is this the only thing that is happening in the patient? No. Another thing that happens is, what did I tell you in the starting guys? I told you that fluids move from high pressure system to low pressure system. 
That is the reason why on the left side the pressures were 120, here it was 25. So during systole, uh, blood from the left ventricle entered into the right ventricle. So this process is happening, let us say it has already been 8 or 9 months, right? So every time whenever there is cardiac cycle happening, every sec, every minute in our body, some amount of blood is going there, going there, going there for, a, for about at a stretch 8 months. Right, eight or nine months, let us say one year continuously. So, day one, you have seen a defect here. You have seen some blood going into the right ventricle. Now, you tell the patient to come after one year. No, I mean, simply theoretically speaking, you tell the patient to come after one year. After one year, when you see the right ventricle, will it have the same fluid or it will be completely stuffed with the fluid? Obviously, every day the blood is going into the right ventricle. So, right ventricle hypertrophy will happen, pulmonary artery hypertension will happen, pulmonary edema, all such changes takes place in an year time. Not only that, now, right now, after one year, right now, just compare which side of the heart the pressures are more, left or right. Yeah, obviously on the right side. Because for, for about an year, blood is keeping on going, going, going and finally the right ventricle is under high pressures. Excess amount of blood, high pressure. Pulmonary artery, more than 25, high pressure. Within pulmonary edema, only when there is pulmonary artery hypertension, there will be pulmonary edema. So this proves, this proves that the right side of the heart is under high pressures. So when the right side of the heart is under high pressures, Rule of thumb which I told you that fluids move from high pressure to low pressure. So right now in the patient, the right side of the heart is under high pressures and the left side comparatively is under low pressures. So now the situation changes. What next thing happens is that fluid from the right side, now when there is ventricular systole, fluid which is located in the right chamber starts jumping into the left side of the heart now. This is called as shunt inversion. Right? This is called a shunt inversion. So what is happening later on? What is happening later on? The shunt, the shunt whatever was there previously, previously it was left to right. Now it is going to be right to left due to high pressures over time. Right to left shunt. This is called a shunt inversion. Shunt inversion. Right? Shunt inversion. Now another important thing I would like to mention is all this data which I have provided you all the way from the first shunt till the last shunt here all of these together you call it as Eisenmenger syndrome. Eisenmenger syndrome. So this is your concept of Eisenmenger syndrome. Clear? So this is the most important pathogenesis that one have to know guys, right? So you have to know this pathogenesis at any cost. Another important thing, people who are having ventricular septal defect, right? They are, at, they are, they are most commonly associated with what all genetic conditions. So these people are most commonly associated with Point number one, point number two, point number three. Three important conditions, right? What are these three important conditions? The first important condition is Down syndrome. Down syndrome. What is Down syndrome? Down syndrome is your trisomy of the 21st pair of chromosome, right? So people most commonly in Down syndrome patients, you gonna see ventricular septal defect. Both of them are always in association. Most of the times, not in 100% of the patients, the second important thing which you would like to see is Dijorge syndrome. Di George syndrome. Now, what is this Dijorge syndrome? Dijorge syndrome is Dijorge syndrome is 22q 11.2 deletion. I am not going to explain in detail. Just very fastly, 22 in the sense chromosome number 22. Let us say this is chromosome number 22. Right? In this there are two parts. This is short arm is called as P, long arm is called as Q. Right? Within this P Q 22 Q 
11.2 deletion within this queue there are uh, within this there are areas 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 10.1, 10.2, 10.3. In the same way, there is a specific area called 11.2 that will be deleted out, right? That would lead to D. George syndrome. The next thing is Turner syndrome. So these patients, ventricular septal defect are more commonly associated with Turner syndrome. So what is Turner syndrome? Turner syndrome is 45X, right? So that is your Turner syndrome. So this is the pathophysiology and those are the associated conditions. And now later on, we're going to see how we are going to examine this patient? For example, if I put a stethoscope on the heart, what sounds can I hear? The murmur. That is important. And if I take an x-ray, what things I can find? As there is a problem to the heart, if I do a 2D echo, what will I find? And finally, we are going to end up this topic discussing the symptoms as well as the treatment part. Right? So in these patients, when I do some investigations, right? The first important thing when I what I do is that uh, I look at the symptoms of the patient in general. So tell me, you tell me the symptoms which you know, guys. What will be the first symptom, right? So forget about this picture. We're gonna talk about this later on. But for now, what you need to know is that in the patient there is a lot of fluid right now in the patient's lungs. So when there is a lot of fluid in the patient's lungs, can the patient breathe normally? No. So when the patient cannot breathe normally, you call this as shortness of breath, right? After that, what is the second symptom which you're going to find? The second important symptom is that as there is no proper oxygen that is delivered, right? Obviously, lungs are completely with the fluid, alveoli are completely with the fluid, then there is no exchange of gases. So when there is no exchange of gases, oxygen does not enter into your body and also carbon dioxide does not leave out of your body. So when oxygen is not entering into your body, it means when oxygenated blood is not entering into your body, then when you keep on walking or when you run, right, then you need to supply oxygenated blood to your muscles. So in this case, if you are having pulmonary edema, then oxygen is not supplied to your muscles because it is not coming inside. So don't you think patient will be extremely fatigued? Yeah, patient will be extremely fatigue patient will be extremely fatigue not only that third important thing is that when such thing is happening in a neonate do you think the neonate will grow no there will be failure to thrive and fourth important thing the fourth most important thing is that there will obviously be difficulty in breathing right and apart from difficulty in breathing, when you are trying to feed the baby, right, there will be sweating, there will be breathlessness, right. So there will be difficulty feeding and sweating while feeding and also difficulty breathing. There will be difficulty in breathing apart from difficulty breathing, there will be sweating when there will be sweating while feeding. So these are the most important complaints. Now after looking at these complaints, what is the second important thing I will do is that I will try to auscultate, right? So when, when I try to auscultate the patient, so these are the basic complaints which you're going to see. After looking at these complaints, I will start to auscultate. Now, when I start to auscultate the patient, some very important things come here. What are those important things? Now, look here. This is the heart, right? This is the borders of the heart. Now, if I, if I imaginarily put a marker over here, right? Now, this will be the left side. This will be the right side. It means, it means this line which I'm drawing over here, right? This line which I'm drawing over here. For example, let us say this is interventricular septum separating the left ventricle with the right ventricle, right? So, yeah, separating the left, I mean, anatomically, this picture is not correct, but uh, you know, conceptually, I need to discuss this. So, I've drawn this picture, and even anatomical markings of this picture are not right because I'm telling you that this is the left ventricle and that is the right ventricle, right? But, anyways, just for a while, think that this is the interventricular septum 
and this is your left ventricle this is your right ventricle right where is that vsd present the ventricular septal defect is exactly present here right the ventricular septal defect is present over here let me make a large one this is your ventricular septal defect so when i check for the murmur right when i check for the murmur what is murmur now what is murmur is when the ventricle contracts 120 mm of pressure is going up as it is going up 50 percent passes through this very small narrow opening so when high pressure is passing through a narrow opening you will you will hear a turbulence and that turbulence is nothing but a murmur right so in this patient i will listen to the murmur exactly where there is ventricular septum where there is a ventricular septal defect so ventricular septal defect is here right what is this location this location is present between the left ventricle and the right ventricle right now anatomically if you see this is the sternum this aperture is located on the left side of the sternum or right side of the sternum it is located on the left side of the sternum so left and it is located lower to the sternum or above the sternum it is located lower to the sternum left lower sternal border left lower sternal border so exactly at this left lower sternal border i would listen to a murmur right now what is that murmur look here now for example let me draw a line all the way like this right so this will be your s1 this will be your s2 that is the second heart sound and this will be the s1 again the first heart sound right so between s1 and s2 whatever you have here right this part is called your systole this is called as your systole next this the, the part that is present between s2 to s1 this one is called as your diastole diastole now when the ventricle is contracting that is called systole that is a time when that high blood pressure i mean 120 mm of mercury pressure blood is going and ending up in the right ventricle so this is happening when the ventricle is relaxing or contracting obviously when the ventricle is contracting it means during systole so during systole as the blood is going up 50 percent enters into the iota the remaining 50 percent comes through these opening into the right ventricle so during systole i am gonna hear the murmur and as this high pressure blood is passing through that very small opening i will listen to some very rough or harsh murmur so that kind of murmur that kind of murmur is like this rough harsh murmur like this right so such type of murmur guys such type of murmur you call it as high pitched high pitched harsh harsh and next what look here this murmur is happening along the entire systole right when the ventricle is contracting that is called systole so till the ventricle contracts the blood keeps on going up 50 percent gets added up to the iota 50 percent comes here now when the so in the entire systole in the entire ventricular contraction you gonna listen to that harsh pitched murmur so you are listening murmur in the systole so you call this as high pitched harsh systolic murmur right high pitched harsh systolic murmur now when the ventricle is relaxing when the ventricular walls are stretching out when it is relaxing that is called as diastole so when the ventricle is relaxing that is called as diastole as these ventricles are relaxing there is negative pressure that is developed in these two ventricles and that negative pressure will suck all the blood from the iota from the pulmonary artery back into the ventricles so obviously there is no surprise that blood from the pulmonary artery will go back blood from the iota will go back but by the time the blood reaches here you have got semilunar walls on both the sides which are shut so immediately blood comes and lands upon that semilunar walls and you're gonna listen to a sound the sudden hitting sound that is called as your s2 sound that is called as your s2 sound okay 
But is there any blood that is actually entering into the ventricle? No. So when blood is not entering into the ventricle, then there is no concept of blood passing into the right or left side. Blood is stopped here within the valves itself, within the iota and within the pulmonary artery itself. Right? So that is the reason why during diastole we don't listen to any murmur. We listen to murmur only when there is systole where there is 50% of blood that is going into the right ventricle. Clear? So that is why it is called as harsh pitched, high pitched harsh systolic murmur which is seen in the entire length of the systole. So I call it as hollow systolic murmur. Hollow systolic murmur clear now this is this is one of the very important thing which you have to know right next important thing next important thing is that point number two point number two what is point number two is that if i take okay fine i i have found when i when i kept my stethoscope over here in the left lower sternal border i listen to this high pitched harsh holosystolic murmur now i will tell the patient now patient wants a proof right i cannot tell the patient now you come on you even you listen to your own heart you will find a high pitched harsh holosystolic murmur patient don't know what is this right so what you need to do is that you need to take an x ray and show it to the patient so the next investigation you do is chest x ray in the chest x-ray what you will find in the chest x-ray you will find that the right ventricle got dilated i mean there is hypertrophy right so you will find in the chest x-ray cardiomegaly not only cardiomegaly as patient is having pulmonary edema right all these pulmonary these are two right and left pulmonary arteries pulmonary arteries will branch into pulmonary arterioles what what am i talking here what am i talking is see these are the pulmonary arteries right so these pulmonary arteries will further branch into arterioles like this right obviously within these arterioles also there is a lot of blood right lot of blood that is accumulated within these small minute capillaries so obviously when you look at an x-ray the, these these are called as capillaries pulmonary capillaries the pulmonary capillaries are stuffed with the blood now so pulmonary capillaries will be dilated so those dilations of pulmonary capillaries which you will find in an x-ray are called as increased pulmonary markings or increased vascular markings so you gonna find increased vascular markings right okay fine so patient is not understanding the x-ray so then i'll tell the patient look i'm gonna do 2d echo an echocardiography within you now when i do echocardiography after chest x-ray right when i do an echocardiography within the echocardiography very clearly i can find the ventricular septal defect right the opening like this i can find it very clearly the septum used to be like this previously now there is an opening like this i can see that very clearly as you can see in the picture here you can very clearly see the ventricular septal defect in case of 2d echo and you can see the next picture over here regarding the cardiomegaly part see how the heart borders are dilated and you can also see a third picture of the pulmonary markings here so 2d echo gives you 2D echo, by the way, it is the most specific test, right? In this, you will find ventricular septal defect. Most specific test is 2D echo, and in this 2D echo, you're gonna find ventricular septal defect. Okay. So regarding the treatment part, what treatments would I give to my patient? So for a neonate, you can give these treatments. That is treatment number one. Treatment number one, treatment number two, and treatment number three. What is the first treatment is, I would give, I would give palivizumab for ventricular septal defect. Even, even when a baby is having ventricular septal defect, there are high chances that the neonate gonna be affected with respiratory syncytial virus. So I will give pavlizumab even 
for ventricular septal defect as well as respiratory syncytial virus RSV okay for both of them and second thing is that obviously there is heart failure later on it will progress to heart failure left heart failure also because the fluid is also going there right so when there is heart failure there's a lot of fluid within the heart so right? this is called as congestive heart failure because there is congestion with the fluid so you have to get rid of this fluid that is the reason why i start giving diuretics diuretics i start giving for heart failure Apart from this, the third important thing I would do is that right now in the patient's pulmonary artery, the normal pressure has to be around 14 millimeter of mercury. But unfortunately, it is more than 25 millimeter of mercury. I have to reduce the pressure in the pulmonary artery. So I will give such a drug which will cause vasodilation of pulmonary artery so that the pressures inside they fall down. They are called as pulmonary vasodilators. For example, sildenafil. Sildenafil, right? So I give for Eisenmenger syndrome. I give for Eisenmenger syndrome, right? So apart from this, if the if the ventricular septal defect is so small, you don't do anything basically, right? Because most of the patients are asymptomatic in case of mild ventricular septal defect. But if the defect is too large, then the symptoms are quite obvious. So in that case, you need to surgically repair that septum. Okay. So this is all regarding the ventricular septal defect. Thank you for watching my video. Goodbye.